Okay, so hello everybody. I'm Aaron Crane, and I'm here to talk about monkey patching, sock passing, and accidental open method overriding. So where I'm coming from is, suppose you're working on some software which uses a third-party class. Maybe it's a open source class, maybe it's commercially brought in from somewhere, it doesn't matter. But one day you think to yourself, wouldn't it be just really helpful if this class had some more methods to make it fit better with what I'm trying to do? Now, there are, in general, two ways of accomplishing that. One is to subclass the third-party class, and the other, at least for languages as dynamic as Perl, is to just stuff the methods you want into the existing class, and that's what we call monkey patching. And if you've been down that road before, you're probably cringing in horror right now, uh, but it is apparently a popular approach, at least in some circles. Let's a couple of uh, examples of places where people are known to have done this and, and what happens though. So here's an example from early 2008. Uh, Prototype is a JavaScript library which has often taken the approach of adding new methods to standard JavaScript classes. Well, they're not really classes in JavaScript, but we can gloss over that for the time being. Um, yeah, wherever Prototype thinks it's going to be handy, it will give you an extra method. So for example, they give you this each method on an array. Um, much easier than iterating over an array's elements by hand. Um, they also had an early implementation of the get elements by class name method, which finds all the HTML elements in the current page that have some particular CSS class. Now, Prototype is actually pretty careful about how it injects methods. In particular, it never adds a method that already exists in the thing it's trying to modify. And that means that if a browser starts natively implementing a method that Prototype wants to implement itself, the browser's native version gets used in preference. So people building web apps with Prototype, uh, they happily started using uh, things like get elements by class name where, where necessary. So uh, document dot, dot get elements by class name dull, family all the dull elements, stick them in this variable dull. And then, oh, we're just going to use dull.each.element.hide. We hide all the dull elements because they're dull. Splendid. Everyone's happy with this, right? Well, sort of. Because then Firefox 3 and Safari 3.1, they started providing native implementations of get elements by class name. And up pops the law of unintended consequences. Um, because the native implementations return a node list object, not an array representing the, the matched elements. Um, and of course, prototypes array.each method doesn't exist on node list. So you try to do this, and your code fails. Coding your web app, web app fails when your end users upgrade their browser. <laughs> Which isn't something you really want to happen. Um, here's another example, different language. Ruby on Rails added a new method to strings called chars which returns a multi-byte safe version of the same string. And I don't need to know what that means in terms of Ruby. I'm afraid I'm not a Rubyist. But nonetheless, that's what it was documented to do. So you say, uh, some string dot chars, and you get the multi-byte safe version. <coughs> OK. But then in August 2008, Ruby 1.8.7, which was just released at that point, added a completely different method of the same name intended to let you iterate over the character of a string. So you say some string dot chars dot max, and that gives you the biggest character, which in this case is T. Um, and this meant that when people using the Rails version of chars upgraded from Ruby 1.8.6 to 1.8.7, their app stopped working, which again is a problem. We don't want that to happen. And at the time, the consensus response to problems like this was you should always use subclassing instead of monkey patching. But I don't really think that helps. Uh, I think there's two big problems with that response. First, it can be an awful lot more effort to make sure that your subclass gets used everywhere you, you want it to be, um, especially for things like the standard string class in a library like, uh, a language like Ruby. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that issue briefly later on. But secondly, and more importantly, I don't think it actually solves the problem. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to take a couple of examples looking at the Perl RM module DBX class, which I'm a huge fan of, by the way. Um, if you don't know DBX class, that's fine. I'll talk you through it. So I suppose you've got a database of books, and you want to count how many distinct authors there are <coughs> in that database of books. 
In plain optics class, that might look something like this. So we say, start with the schema, uh, find the book result set, and then to search within there, we just want to pull out the author ID columns, but just the distinct ones, and then count what we've got, got out of that. That's standard optics class, that will just work if you've got a suitable schema. Um, now, of course, this is quite a lot of code for something that's relatively simple, and it has, in particular, the annoying feature that uh, the, the count bit, which is really quite important, has been hidden at the end of this relatively long method call. So you think, well, maybe I should write a method to simplify that. So you'd like to be able to say something like doll schema arrow result set book arrow count distinct author ID. How many distinct author IDs are there? <coughs> And suppose you're a well-behaved sort of programmer, you've heard that this monkey patching thing is evil, so you subclass instead. So you've got your subclass which does nothing to have this method, my dbit result set, uh, use base to its class result set, and here's our new method, sub count distinct, and it just does the obvious thing. Um, so you then jump through all the hoops necessary to make sure your subclass is used in all the appropriate places, which by the way, retrofitting that to an existing uh, Divix class schema that lots of tables in it, that can be irritating, but nonetheless, you jump through those hoops uh, and you write some tests and they all pass and then your work here is done. Wonderful. And then, sometime later, the sysadmin is keeping your app running, decides it's time to upgrade Divix class. Now, in general, the upgrade Divix class, you can expect that to go pretty smoothly because the Divix class developers do a fine job and they have good <laughs> test coverage and, you know, it's all good. But you can't really guarantee it. Suppose that the Divix class developers have also been annoyed by the inconvenience of having to write out lots of code like this just to do uh, counting distinct column values. And they've added their own method. But perhaps their version has a slightly different type of API. Maybe it takes multiple column names rather than just a single column. And the implementation isn't really any more complicated, but nonetheless, they thought of doing that and your version didn't. Oh well. So, when you've got a situation like this, the test for your version of count distinct will still pass because everything your method handles is also handled by the new upstream method. And the tests for the new version of Divix class itself, well, they're also going to pass because when they're run, your code hasn't even been loaded. It's completely nothing to do with it. But suppose that this new version of Divix class, this hypothetical new version of Divix class, also includes another method which invokes count distinct with multiple column names, <coughs> something like this. And if that method gets invoked on a plain to its class result set, then that's fine. But if it ever gets invoked on an instance of your subclass, you just silently get the wrong behavior. In this case, I very carefully constructed it so that, well, that's a, an array of, you know, you, you, the wrong thing will happen silently, and good luck finding that. Um, and of course, this means that no matter how much work you went through to make sure that you created a subclass rather than just monkey patching a different method in, you still make things break. This is, that's the sense in which I, I think that subclassing doesn't actually solve the problem. And of course, this can be expected to happen in, as far as I can tell, pretty much any programming language, including languages that are much less dynamic than Perl. All it takes is for you to take a third-party class, Subclass it with an action method, and then later on, a new version of the third party class adds a method with the same name as yours and uses it somewhere in its own implementation. So, in effect, the distinction between the two versions of the third party class gives you a peculiar sort of temporal dynamism, even if you've got uh, you know, lots of static method name resolution and all that sort of thing. But of course, the great thing about Perl is we can fix it. So, we want to prevent that sort of accidental overriding, but how? So the, the problem is, we say, well, we, we accidentally overrode this uh, count distinct method from our inheritance graph when we thought we were adding a new method. So how do we want to, how should we go about making that impossible? We can't just directly legislate against overriding methods in derived classes. I mean, sometimes that's just the thing you want to do, right? So let's look at the various cases. So the simplest thing is defining a method in a class with no superclasses. So package base, sub m1, plain old method, of course that's fine. 
Similarly, if you have a derived class and you add a new method in that derived class, that's also fine. Derive one, use base, base, sub m2. If it's not defined in base, it's a new method, that's fine. It's also, of course, fine to write a derived class method which knows about base class version, but clearly can't be accidental. So derive two inherits from base, uh, it's going to use MROC3 so we can get next method. And we say that this sub M1, um, it does something else first and then it moves on to what would have been done originally. Okay? Clearly not accidental. Then the tricky case is something like this. Derived 3 inherits from base, it has a method M1. How can you tell whether that's deliberate or accidental? Well, there just isn't enough information there to work out the answer to that question. And for that matter, even with the M1 in derived 2, the version that used the next method to extend the behavior of the inherited method, it's hard to observe from the outside that that's what you're actually trying to accomplish. It seems we need more precision in describing our classes. And of course, some object systems give you just that. Um, Moose, for example, uh, builds on class mark, which is of course actually part of Moose. Um, class mark method object protocol it gives you method modifiers. So Moose would let you write the derived two example this way. Package derived two, it's a Moose class, it extends base, and before invoking the inherited M1 method, just do something else. That's much nicer. So rather than directly overwriting M1 with a new version that coincidentally happens to do a new thing and go back to the original implementation, we're specifically saying that this is a simple modification of the inherited method. And of course, there's a similar after modifier which does what you expect, and around which is roughly like a combination of the two. And there's also an override modifier which just replaces the inherited method. So we could write out a derived three example like this. The derived three is a Moose class which inherits from base, and we override the inherited M1 with some new code. So these method modifiers seem to be exactly what we need for distinguishing deliberate from accidental method overriding. You can decide that you reserve plain method def definition syntax, so sub M1 or what have you, for defining methods that you don't expect to exist in your superclasses, and that you'll always use method modifiers when you want to deliberately override or extend an inherited method. And then, once you've done that, it's possible to programmatically detect accidental overriding just by interrogating the model. And I think that um, it's very likely you find that the discipline of relying on method modifiers does actually make your code clearer. I think before is a much more precise statement about what you're doing than the equivalent you get with things like next method. Um, but nonetheless, let's move on from that and look at how we actually go about writing some code that determines whether a method has been implicitly overwritten. So let's start with a function named check class, which will take a class name as its argument and throw an exception if that class overrides any method in its inheritance graph other than using an explicit method modifier. So you say, okay, we find the, the, the meta object representing the class in question. Um, we find the implicit overrides and then die if we've got any. And of course, the heavy lifting is done by this uh, implicitly overridden function. Um, so what does that do? Well, this is a sample implementation that I think is probably unreliable. Um, it's a proof of concept, it vaguely works. It's not meant to be for <coughs> reproduction use. Essentially what it's doing is saying, okay, well, let's find the, the meta object representing the meta in me method in question. And then we kind of know what uh, method modifier is going to look like, what classes they're going to be blessed in. So as long as the method we're looking at uh, is a blessed into one of the, the method modifier classes, then it's fine, or rather than it, it is implicitly overwritten. But if it's a method modifier, um, uh, if it is a method modifier, then it's been explicitly overwritten and we won't die at all. And with this code, something like that, it's quite easy to put together a pragma-like module that lets an individual class opt into that sort of checking. Um, and in practice, it does have to be opt-in so that you can add it piecemeal to an existing class hierarchy. And the idea is that a class which wants this error checking can just say, use explicit overrides and guarantee to get a compile time error if it accidentally overrides any base class methods. 
And implementing it is surprisingly straightforward. Package explicit overrides. Um, we're going to store the list of classes we need to check at the right time. At check time, we go through and check them. And we arrange that whenever someone says, use explicit overrides, we just add the class that's, import, that's trying to import us to the list of classes to check, and everything will work, roughly. Um, I'm going to skip through a couple of additional slides about Java and C-sharp, because hey, no one wants to hear about those, right? Um, so, um, we can feel pretty pleased with ourselves at this point. A little discipline when writing a subclass, and a couple of dozen lines of code in a module like Explicit Overrides, and we can guarantee that upgrading a, a dependency to an incompatible version will cause a compile time error. But of course, the other problem with using subclassing instead of monkey patching is that it can be really awkward to make sure your subclass is used everywhere it should be. So that's especially true for things like Ruby string chars method. You want your new method to be available on ordinary string literals and on strings returned from arbitrary code and that sort of thing. And Perl does have overload constant to help you with that, but it doesn't really help when you're trying to extend one specific class in the middle of a, a large system of cooperating classes, as in the Divix class result set case. <coughs> so, can we do something similar to monkey patching? Well, it turns out it's actually easier. Because we're just dropping a method into a class, <coughs> we don't need a mock to work out whether the class really has a method of that name. So, how might we want to override safe monkey patching to work? Um, this is, I think, a reasonable sort of API. We say, use monkey patch, and you supply the, the name of the class you want to monkey patch, and a hasher of method names and bodies, and what will want to happen is that the class should get loaded, and these code refs should be injected into that class under the appropriate names. Except if the class already has a method of the relevant name, it should throw an exception. And, of course, implementing this is, again, pretty easy. Package monkey patched, it's going to use uh, croak. So when it gets used, we have our target class and hash methods, and we, uh, we load the class, and then we just go through each of the methods we're trying to inject. Um, if, it's already, if the class in question already has that, then we throw an exception. Otherwise, we install the subroutine into the class. And install sub just looks like this. It does what you expect with the sub name and fill in the symbol table and so on and so on. And this code is already available on CPAM uh, under the name x or column when patched. The x prefix just indicates that the API is still considered experimental, so if anyone has any comments on it, I'd be glad to hear them. Um, and I am actually using this code in production at my company, and I really like it. I like the fact I can trivially inject methods into my existing classes without having to find suitable ways of writing and using subclasses wherever needed. But I also get to sleep soundly in the knowledge that this monkey patching is safe even if one of my dependencies gets upgraded incompatibly. And the error happens at compile time, so just trying to load my code will fail, which means I can be certain my tests will fail, and of course I'd never upgrade anything on a live system without testing it on a dev box first. So, the conclusions from this are possibly surprising. First, it's odd to find that subclassing is no safer than monkey patching. And second, even though they can both be dangerous if done without care, a specially dynamic language, like Perl, lets you make both of them entirely safe. So much for the alleged danger of monkey patching. Thank you. Heckles from the do you front row there. Do you think monkey patching is a good idea? So I think monkey patching is a good idea. Um, it's sometimes the most straightforward response to the situation you're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, it, is it morally desirable? I don't hold a position on that. Uh, sorry. Why don't you put the curl dock uh, for the monkey patching? If you subclass, you can put the curl dock in the subclass, which is quite obvious for someone else maintaining the code. But if you just start putting arbitrary methods in, isn't that a good <coughs> um, Yeah, that's a good point. That's why I haven't considered. Um, I, I don't find that a problem, but then I probably don't write as much documentation as I might. And I'm not saying that we should go around writing our CPAM modules like this. I'm saying that you know, if you've got a, a private code base,
ways where you can <coughs> you can assume that the people working on the code can be pointed in the direction of documentation. Probably not a problem in practice. But. It's quite interesting because the GitHub has actually encouraged people to multiply to use categories. Yes. For about 25 years. Um, yes. So you know, it's it's quite common to do it. Do they have any way of dealing with the accidental overriding problem? Uh, well, you, I don't know really because you have all the metadata. Um, I don't know whether you would call it something different, but the thing that I've most often done that I believe is done for monkey patching is CPAN module A that I need to use is either CPAN module B, which has a bug in it, and I'm patching a method in there to fix the bug. Patching existing because method. I can't stop this because this isn't providing me a way to say use, use my subclass sub sub yeah. instead. Um, Yes. Um, in that case, I am knowingly replacing it with this one. Yeah, um, it, it's a valid problem and one that this stuff is time to address. Um, and there's no reason you should be able to, I mean, doing it manually is, you know, you, you uh, find a, the relevant code graph for the original version, you write your own wrapper that evokes it, and you install your wrapper into the symbol table. And yes, one could design an API to make that simpler and easier. Um, I, I haven't done it. I'm just wondering if you can just, if, if you can avoid a single collision just by convention, i.e. if I patch a module, you know, so C style, I prefix it with something which has, which is, you know, which is not you can, to the other domain. Yeah, you can probably pick a name that you think is not the other domain, but it's the prefix, so you still have a semantic in the you know, bit in it. Yeah, you know, you're just still, uh, yes, you can get to some degree of confidence that, that nothing's going to break, or if you use an approach like this, then you get to be actually confident. You, <laughs> you go to bed and you do actually sleep sound, I sleep sound very much. Uh, I didn't like doing this when I was doing it the, the bad way, and, and now I don't worry about it. If I want to, you need to break. It breaks clean. It breaks clean, needs to tie, now I have to go and fix it. That's the point, yeah.